So here's an appreciation of Scott Joplin's opera, Tremonitia. Many people are aware that Scott Joplin did write an opera. It is sometimes referred to as a ragtime opera, although he himself disliked that moniker. So while many classical music and opera aficionados are aware that Trimonesia exists, what is somewhat less well known is that he wrote at least one other opera before. This was an earlier work, and the one that we know of is called A Guest of Honor. Teddy Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington for dinner at the White House. We don't know what transpired between the two men. That's what he's writing about. And unfortunately, we don't know what the opera is really about either because it's been lost. We do know that this opera did get mounted and produced because we have seen newspaper clippings where it was going to be put on. Unfortunately, this story ends when the promoter overnight absconded with all of the receipts and puts an end to a guest of honor. So after writing that one, he did write Tremonesia, and after he finished it, he knew. He knew that he had something that was worthwhile, and on and off for the rest of his life, he worked at trying to get this thing produced and more well-known. Now, by this point in his career, Scott Joplin was pretty well-known as a composer, and he was actually reasonably well-off. He was selling piano music, he was teaching, he was getting royalties off the music, but there was no way he had the financial clout to put on a complete opera. So he had to find some financial backers. He got as far as doing a semi-staged performance on stage. He had the singers up there. They weren't doing much except singing, and he was at the piano playing a reduction of the orchestral score. And in the audience, there were potential financial backers. By all accounts, including Scott Soplins himself, the performance was a disaster, and it crushed him. We don't really know exactly what happened here but he was determined to get this opera produced. So eventually what he did is he decided to produce it himself. He wrote and sold more music, he took on more students, and eventually he did raise enough money to get this thing on the road. So you will see some claims that this opera never actually saw the light of day, and for a long time that was believed to be true. But recent scholarship by Rick Benjamin, this fellow here, and others, have shown that that might not actually be true, because he went through newspapers from the era in the South and through the Midwest, and he found 16 notices in newspapers that this opera was going to be produced. And of those 16, only two were canceled, coincidentally, both of those in Iowa. Now, of those other 14 performances, could those have been canceled also? Of course, that could have happened, but I think it's safe to assume that at least some of those 14 performances did happen and that people saw them. Unfortunately, we don't have much more than that because there were no reviews or notices after that. So Scott Joplin took as his inspiration grand European opera, and you can see it in terms of form and structure that he has here. It's in three acts. That's pretty normal for a European opera. There's a somewhat longer first and third act, somewhere around 35 minutes or so a piece, and a shorter act in the middle. It's about 20 minutes long. There is an overture, fabulous by the way, wait until you hear this. There are dance numbers, there are arias, there are recitatives, again, very much in the tradition of a grand European opera. There are differences, however. The location and the subject matter are different than what European opera writers were writing about, and it's also quite a bit shorter. Joplin knew that he was not going to be able to get his audiences to sit through a two and a half or three hour work, so this is quite short. It's about 90 minutes long, and I think that actually helps the work because things move very quickly. There's very few dead spots in all of this. So those of you who do know this work probably know it through this recording here. It's the Deutsche Grammophon recording from 1975, original cast recording, that is good. Unfortunately, we don't have the orchestration. It's been lost. So any version that you see or hear is going to be someone's reconstruction of the orchestration from the piano reduction. In this case, it's the one by Gunther Schuller, and it sounds pretty good. And that's the way things sat for a very long time until scholars like Rick Benjamin came along, and he wipes the slate clean. He says, you know what? As good as that one is, I think I can do better. 
He has a personal collection of some 10,000 musical scores from the era, and studying those, he says, I think I know how this might have really sounded like. And his contention is that the Houston Grand Opera performance, well, it's a little bit too grand. <laughs> there are too many players in the pit, the chorus is too large. In reality, this was never going to work. Scott Joplin did not have the financial resources to have that many people moving around. The traveling shows of the time, based on, say, minstrel shows, tended to be light and fast and agile. They had to be able to set up and break down very quickly and move from city to city. There is no way that many musicians could have done this and let, let alone have him pay for all of this. So what he does is he has an orchestral reduction. Now the reduction is, I think about 11 players plus the piano. 11 plus P was actually a thing back then. So in other words, there is one violin, no, no first violin section, one second violin, one coronet, one trombone, one piano, and, and so forth. Lest you think that 11 players plus a piano cannot generate a sufficient volume to fill a concert hall, I draw your attention to the orchestral reduction of Copland's At Appalachian Spring for chamber orchestra. If you've ever heard that performed live, they have no problem generating volume. So when you hear this, it's a thinner sound, it's a more immediate, direct sound, it's a more in-your-face sound. And as much as I like the Houston Grand Opera production, I think I like this one better. So this one here sounds like a Verdi opera set in the American South. This one here actually feels like you're in the American South around the turn of the 20th century. So even if you have the Deutsche Grammophon recording, I'm going to go ahead and suggest that you get this. And here's a case where having the physical product is better than just having the digital files by themselves. If you look this up on Amazon, I think they actually classify this as a book. And in fact, it is a 112-page book, and there just happened to be two CDs sort of tucked into the covers here, but all of this in between, this is wonderful. He goes through the history and Joplin's life, and he corrects certain errors that he says have crept into the modern parlance. There's a libretto here, and he justifies the decisions that he's made. And I tell you, this thing sounds really authentic when you listen to it, and it's really well written. In fact, as soon as I got done reading this, I went right back to the beginning and read it all over again. Okay, what's the plot? What's Trimonesia about? Well, it's pretty simple. It's an opera in three acts. Ned and Monisha are childless. One day they find a young girl at the base of a tree, so Monisha names her Tree Monisha. She works as a housekeeper for a white woman and says, in exchange for my services, I would like you to educate my daughter. She wanted her daughter to be educated. If you read about Joplin's life, this has parallels with his own life because education, he said, changed his life. So she comes back, and as the opera opens, there are men selling bags of luck to the clan. And what that is is you pay money and you buy these bags and you hand, hang them on your door and it brings you luck. Well, Tree Manisha, she comes back changed. She's, ex she's educated and she says, no, don't buy those things, that is wrong. Again, mirroring Joplin's own experiences that education has the power to banish mysticism and superstition. Well, this is good, except now that she has upset the status quo, and in Act 2, they kidnap Trimonesia, and in Act 3, they recover her. When they bring her back, they catch the men who did this, and they said, take them out and punish them. And again, she puts her foot down and says, no, that's not who we are. We don't do those things. Again, these are progressive ideas for the time. And at the end of the opera, they said, we need someone to lead us, to represent us, to speak for us. And they elect Trimonisha to lead, her, lead them. So again, progressive ideas for the time. So again, this feels very authentic. As much as I like the Deutsche Grammophon performance, if I had to hear this opera again right now, I'd probably listen to this one.
And there are some terrific numbers in here. I mentioned the overture, which is fantastic. There is a ring play, or a ring dance, as they call it, that will have you tapping your toes. And the closing number is a dance called a real slow drag. And there are instructions in here as to exactly how you're supposed to perform this dance. You're supposed to slide one way, and you slide the other way. And when you slide, you're supposed to drag the other foot. And there's a specific direction you're supposed to drag the foot. And when everybody does this on stage, it looks pretty good. So I invite you to check that out. There's one postscript here. Towards the end of this book, he tells an anecdote. Sometime in the 1990s in New York, he was putting on a performance. And afterwards, backstage, someone came up to him and said, there's a man in the audience who says he must speak with you. And he says, well, who is it? And the guy says, I think he's a lawyer. And he goes, oh, no, what have I got to deal with now? So in walks this elderly, distinguished, well-dressed black gentleman who says, I was part of the legal team that dispersed the final contents of Scott Joplin's estate in the 1960s. Now, keep in mind, in the 1960s, Joplin was not as well known as he was today. In fact, the revival didn't take place until the early 1970s when Josh Rifkin came along and others. You know, the movie The Sting came along. Really only in the past 50 years has Joplin's name been a household name. So the man says, by the 1960s, the possessions had all been dispersed and watered down and there wasn't a lot left. The heirs took what they wanted and they said, just deal with the rest of it or throw it away. In comes a bunch of boxes and three or four of those boxes have the word Trimanesha written on them. And the guy said he remembered the word because it was such an unusual word. He opened up the boxes and there were pieces of paper inside. There were orchestral parts. There were, you know, violin, cello. The papers were not in good condition. They were water stained. And keep in mind, Joplin was not a household name back then. He said, and according to Rick Benjamin, he says the guy looked really embarrassed when he said this. He said, I threw them out. Could those have been Joplin's original orchestrated parts for Tremonisha? Well, I hope I've given you some inspiration to go out and seek this music. I hope you found this information informative and entertaining. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.